ังจากเพื่อนบ้านที่ใกล้ๆเราบ้างนะครับเพื่อนบ้านเราในภูมิภาคเอเชียตะวันออกเฉียงใต้ประเทศที่มีมูกแล้วก็ใช้กันอย่างมากๆอย่างเป็นรูปธรรมคงหนีไม่พ้นมาเลเซียนะครับเขามีกระบวนการดําเนินงานมีความสําเร็จในเลเวลที่อ้างอิงได้นะครับเป็นแบบอย่างได้แล้วก็อาจจะมีอะไรหลายอย่างที่เป็นประโยชน์กับพวกเราครับดังนั้นเดี๋ยวเรามาฟังจากผู้แทนจากมาเลเซียมูกนะครับ Ladies and gentlemen and the next session will be our distinguished presenter from Malaysia um, she is associate professor Dr Wan Suhaini binti Saad right now she is the uh, chair lady of Malaysia Mook and uh, please join me to welcome her to share with us secret of Malaysia Mook big secret Okay. Um, very good morning, uh, Dr. Tapani and distinguished guests. Thank you, Michael. <coughs> so I'm um, I'm one, easy to remember. One, two, three, one. Yeah. I'm actually now um, the director of the academic um, development management division in the Ministry of Education. Uh, was recently point, uh, appointed. And uh, MOOCs and the OER and the academic development is under my division. Um, I'm actually a microbiologist. I teach microbiology in the Faculty of Biotechnology and Biomolecular Sciences. Anybody uh, here is from life sciences? No? All from educational. You're from life sciences. You're, what do you teach? Anishai. Pharmacy, right. And you? Physiology. Okay, at least we have something similar. But what I'm trying to, to, to share here is, although that we are from different backgrounds, what we, we, are, um, we always want to have the same objective, to achieve what, to get our students know how learning is done, to guide our students. And now we are looking into... Uh, personalized learning, for example, how students can learn by themselves. And one of the ways for them to become self-determined learners is through MOOCs. Now, in the, um, this is from the World Economic Forum, where in 2020, uh, the soft skills, like for example, like creativity, if you can see, in 2015, creativity is number 10. But in 2020, it is predicted creativity is at number 3. Of course, critical thinking and problem solving is still number uh, 1 and number 2. But if you can see here, the students, and, and if you can see also, uh, in 2015, there is that uh, emo emotional intelligence was not even in the list. But in 2020, emotional intelligence is two uh, number six. So I think it's very important that the students, the learners, our learners, <laughs> would develop all these soft skills from either from the uh, content, from the curriculum, from our education. And we are talking about Gen Z students. Okay, where are you? <laughs> Gen X. A lot of us may be here, here, Gen X, right? And the students now, they are here at Gen Z. And in a few years, you will see all these people from Gen Alpha, right? And these students, they see things in 4D, four-dimensional, right? The characteristic of these Gen Z students. They love social, they love to, to socialize through social media. They see things visually. They do not want to sit and listen to you in the class. They want to be involved. 
they want to speak out their minds. And they want, they, they are, these are the people who has very low attention span. Meaning that if they watch video, how long do you think they, they, they can watch video? If let's say it is your video, your, your own face, teaching, how long do you think that they can spend? One minute, maybe, right? Some people say the Gen, Gen Z student, they take about like goldfish, only eight seconds. <laughs> right, some, okay. So they, they are less focused unless those attract them, you know. Then, then if something that attracts them, they will be more focused. They are very interactive and that's why we need to redesign our learning for these Gen Z students, learners, to become more personalized. They, it should be something, it should, the content should be uh, personalized uh, driven, meaning that when they when they connect or engage into one content and they find it very interesting for them, they would want to explore. When they explore, they, we assume that they learn. But our challenge is how to make the content, how to deliver the content in such a way that can engage all these students. So in Malaysia, we have what we call the open education policies. In 2015, the, the previous government, now we have a new government. At that time, the Ministry of Higher Education was separated from the Ministry of Education. In May this year, after the election, the Ministry of Education is now combined. So the higher education together with the uh, K-12 to in one ministry. So, uh, this Malaysian education blueprint uh, was developed to project the um, education in Malaysia from 2015 to 2025. We have also developed the national e-learning policy that yet to be reviewed soon to improve. In the Malaysian higher education blueprint, Looking at the building momentum and lay foundation that was uh, 2015, and now we are at the accelerate system improvement and towards the excellent, meaning that we are looking at different um, different pathways also, looking at graduate uh, holistic improvement, looking at globalized online learning. Uh, graduate employability, talent development, and the initiative under the government uh, uh, initiative, we have also uh, we have MOOC, and and of course uh, the blended learning is done in in all uh, institution. So the Malaysia MOOCs framework. This is our Malaysia MOOCs framework, where I'm sure this is the. Um, general uh, MOOCs development that has been um, exercised by many institutions where the ecosystem will have the governance, the pedagogy, curriculum, content development and lastly on the enculturation. And the process would include all the action plans and of course we would be looking at the uh, how these MOOCs would be able to enhance in teaching and learning, to produce the learners, and also how it can help in the lifelong learning. And I think one of the biggest challenge is also the enculturation. I mean, in Malaysia. So the domains of national e-learning -E policy, we have one. We are, we will look at the infrastructure and the infrastructures. This is actually the pillars of our national e-learning uh, e policy because, you know, without the infra and the infrastructures, a lot of things will not be move, move on. And then, of course, the governance. How can the governance help in, uh, the, in the management, help in improving the MOOCs or the online learning and also the online pedagogy? A lot of people think that, okay, I have a MOOC, you know, so you all go ahead and, you know, learn that MOOC and that's it, right? 
but it's actually how when you actually start to design, designing a MOOC is not as easy as you think. And people think, oh, I have a video. I have a few videos in my online courses and that's it, right? So that is the wrong mindset. And if you do not have, if you yourself do not have a MOOC, you please do, and have not experienced any courses or any, if you have not joined any MOOCs, so please don't tell us that you know about MOOC. I mean, frankly speaking. <laughs> Okay, e-content. This is the this is the the, the uh, tricky part because developing content. Um, I mean, earlier in in Malaysia when we started to develop MOOC in two thousand, it was uh, only in two thousand fourteen, and e-content it was in the form of videos, only in videos, and video that you know the lecturers talking in the video. After that, in 2015, then we change a little bit about the e-content because we think that since you know the, the the Gen Z characteristics, so the content must be in different format. It can be a video of you talking. It can be a video of animation using Videoscribe or Powtoon or Go Animate. It can be also a shooting the video that you go out and 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 take shootings of uh, and upper visitings, um, the temples, for example, for certain courses. So it depends on the courses and depends how creative you are to design the content. And professional development. Okay, um, in uh, in cert most of the institution, developing developing a MOOC by the uh, educators can be one of the what we call as KPI, Key Performance Index. So if let's say if you have one MOOC per one semester, it will be counted in your key performance. That means you will get marks for your promotion, for example. Uh, and Certain uh, 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 MOOCs that we develop also can be used as part of the training um, certification for professional development. And lastly, the enculturation, enculturation part. We need to get people to know about MOOCs. We need to get people to be aware how important is MOOC. And we need to get the people to even use MOOCs. Okay. Okay, uh, one of the domain just now is online pedagogy. Uh, this is the blended learning. Now, our MOOC also used as blended learning, meaning that if you have developed a MOOC that is participated by many other people from around the world, the content using MOOC can be used as a technique for flipped classroom in the class. Okay, so th that's what we call as blended MOOC. That means you use the MOOC as your content, but during class, you do activities with your students, right? But of course, one of the uh, issues or challenges in using MOOC is the engagement. How engaged is the participant or how engaged is the learners when they use your MOOC? Because if you're just going to have videos, content, and there is no inter interactive activity in the MOOC, they will they call it as the scroll of death. You just scroll and then at lastly they will die. The people who scroll, the, the whole course will die because nobody is going to complete your MOOC, right? So this is these are the, the um I'm just showing example. For example, if we were to focus on the e-content um, domain just now so we have the focus area um, and then a uh, different phase of the development. So this one, when we say 10% of all courses offered must have original e-content. Uh, at phase 2, 20%. That means this is per, per course done by from each uh, institutions. My divisions only cater for uh, university, public universities. So look, I look after 20 public universities in Malaysia. So each inst uh, each universities each university will uh, will be provided certain fund to develop 
a MOOC for for each university each year. Last year was two MOOC per university. This year, only one MOOC, only one MOOC because less budget. Uh, but that is given by the by the government. But each institution is free to develop their own MOOC. Provided the funding from each institution themselves, okay. So the shift line in the um, there are ten shifts actually in the Malaysian education bl blueprint. Number nine is the globalized online learning. So we actually focus just now. Uh, Dr. Jitendra mentioned about quality, quality of MOOC. I think quality also is very important. You can have, as I mentioned, the uh, designing the content work and designing the uh, learning activities. You have the content, the the the, the uh, resources, the material. What will be the learning activities for the learners to do, to understand or to 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 understand, to enhance their learning about the content, about the material, and what will be the self assessment that the student can do when after they have done after they have looked at the uh, resources and do the learning activities okay so that's the part of the quality of the content uh, of the MOOC that is very important so Malaysia MOOC is governed by the uh, uh, Malaysia of uh, Ministry of Education is coordinated by this uh, national e-learning e council so we have the Ministry of Education. Under Ministry of Education, we have the National E-Learning Center. Okay, National E-Learning Center. Uh, National E-Learning Center will oversee all the um, e-learning activities in the higher institution, public and private, together with the schools. That is the National E-Learning Center, and the National E-Learning Council (MEPTA) is only for public universities so the government's funding only goes to the public universities to develop MOOCs uh, just now okay now um, the four okay we have four pioneer courses started in 2014 uh, that is the Islamic civilization and Asian uh, civilization and then we have, this is done by the University Putra Malaysia. So one university developed this one MOOC to be shared with the other 19, 19 universities. And integration of ethnic relations in Malaysia in uh, entrepreneurship and ICT competency. So all these four courses are actually compulsory for the students to take to graduate. If they don't take, they cannot graduate. So... But this one is done, money, uh, funding are given to these four universities to develop this first MOOC in 2014 to be shared by all the other 19 universities. So in 2000, that was the first time, the first MOOC uh, that, that developed. You see, four, four MOOCs started with four MOOCs only. And then uh, money was given in 2015 to develop two MOOCs. So for each public university, we have 40. 40 MOOCs plus 4, 44. And then um, this year, we only give one MOOC. So it's another 20. So it's about 60. So we say plus minus is about 80 MOOCs. But now we have 789 MOOCs. So it's about 80 to 100 MOOCs only are funded by the government. The rest are from their own institution. So the, these are the 20 public universities. And each will dif with different niche uh, engineering. For example, we have four public universities that focus on the engineering. Uh, we have five research universities. And the rest are what we call comprehensive universities. We, at first, in 2014, we used the openlearning.com platform, openlearning.com. So all our public university, uh, universities uh, 
uh, MOOC uh, in openlearning.com. This year, we have this mymooc.my uh, local um, platform that cater for the public universities. Uh, openlearning.com is the Australian platform. Uh, Australian. Uh. Okay. We use these four pillars of the fourth industrial revolution to design our MOOC, uh, personalize, uh, predictive, preventive, and participatory. It's very important that we want the learners who join certain course to participate. Um, there are questions from the other ministry. How do you know that your MOOC is popular? From all your millions of just now, Dr. Jitendra, from your the, in India, which one? How do you uh, classify? How do you classify your MOOC is popular from the number of enrollments? From the number of enrollment or from the number of completion? Uh, I think everywhere is that that is the biggest issue. You can have hundred thousands of of people joining your MOOC, enroll, but completion percentage, how much? Right? And why and the question is, why did they stop in sometimes at at the first module? Sometimes like, you know, at the first glance maybe they never come back, right? So very important. Come back to the learning design just now. Okay. I think this is um one of the guides that we use to design our MOOC to have flexible learning pathways. We, of course, we have the teacher pace and then the self pace and then what we call the mixed mode. Or we can also have like um, a MOOC where you have self pace but you will have a virtual engagement that you set in your MOOC that you're going to meet the learners virtually at certain time, for example, okay, using um, using video conferences app, for example, like um, Zoom. Have you heard of Zoom? A uh, Zoom dot us or Big Blue Button. Uh, those are the two uh, virtual learning uh, uh, virtual learning apps that we use for virtual conferences. Seamless learning. Your MOOC, your online course should be seamless. That means the student should be able to access at any time, anywhere, anyhow. So we came up with this uh, guideline for the development and delivery of Malaysia MOOC. Uh, I think this was in 2000, uh, 2015. So, this guideline um, gives an idea. This is just a guideline. When you have this guideline, the, each institution, they, they can use as reference. But if they don't actually follow it, we don't actually uh, give them any penalty because it's not a policy. It's just a guideline. But with the guideline, it actually ha will help them to develop the MOOC. Uh, 2016, we came out with the guidelines on credit transfer for MOOCs by the Malaysian uh, Qualification Agency. <coughs> I think this one is very important. Um, the way forward. Huh? I have. Thank you so much. Way forward of the uh, MOOC. One of the way to sustain um, MOOCs is by having credit transfer. We're thinking of like, you know, during the semester break, for example, the students can take any, like, like what we call like buffet, you know, buffet, or what they call like Uber University, yeah? Uber University. I can take this, see what are the menus, huh? what are the courses, and then you can take here three credits, three credits. After I have all my 12 credits, I use this 12 credit to be transferred in my degree, right? And then, the, the, of course, with 
uh, suitable proper certification, right? Some of the um, universities they have what they call the competency based assessment. After you have taken all these uh, uh, courses. In the local university, you have to take a competency base, a competency assessment whether or not whatever that you have learned met the quality, uh, quality of the of the course. Uh, but I think um, credit transfer uh, will be helpful if it is done proper way, right? And of course, uh, with a good structure and organization by each institution. Uh, this guideline can help to uh, create to develop the credit transfer uh, mechanism in your institution. Uh, last week, is it last week? Twelve, uh, twelve September, we actually uh, launched this book, but it's still in Malay. We have not um, ha translated it into uh, English, but we are in the process. Uh, Best practices for Malaysian uh, uh, MOOC. It is actually a uh, compilation of the from the seven hundred over um, MOOC courses developed. We create we actually um, uh, actually reviewed all the good quality of um, uh, content development and delivery, and from there we came up with this um, like reference on how to develop and deliver MOOC. Uh, in effective way, for example, uh, what kind of video? How long is the video? What will be the attention grabber? You know what is attention grabber? Yeah. So uh, those are the uh, what are the tools for this animation? So I think this uh, would be good for you. Um, once it is ready, I can give to Tapani to be shared uh, to everyone. The one in the English. Now in the uh, credit transfer MOOC also, we call it this one APEL. APEL is actually Accreditation of Prior Experiential Learning Credit Award. Now, in APEL, let's say if you have finished your high school, right? Finish your high school. And in Malaysia, if we finish high school, we cannot straight away go to take our degree, undergraduates. We have to either take a diploma or take a foundation course. Then only you can take your degree. But in APLC, if you have, ex like, let's say for example, um, you have um, working experience, or you, you like, say for uh, you're a musician, you have work, uh, you have study, uh, you have work as a musician, and uh, you took a few MOOC courses. Right, you can use that to do your degree as a like a credit transfer also, plus your working experience. So you don't have to go through your diploma or your foundation to do your degree. So MOOC is one of the ways for this what we call the APLC. So it's more to uh, uh, informal learning. Okay, in credit transfer, these are the major criteria. Uh, one, of course, is the quality, whether or not that um, course that you take is enough or sufficient based on the syllabus that you want to transfer the credit. And also whether or not that is, uh, as I mentioned just now, the verification achievement and the authentications of the candidates. This one also very important because there are people who can easily manipulate certification, certified, and 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 all these certification must be uh, validated in the ministry first for credit transfer. And of course, we give a lot of training. I think in the uh, academic division, academic development division, uh, training is you you cannot run from training. Everybody needs to be trained, and MOOCs is one of the way that we are trying to develop professional development for 
training of teachers and educators. I think it goes through the corporate also, through the corporate organization, through the uh, other companies and organization, which they can use MOOC for their uh, employees training. Okay, so uh, some of the setup for content development, we have uh, uh, this one, what we call the iStudio, right? But this one will cost you. So we are supposed to be the what we call the 21st century educators. We, 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 we. Mm. That's why we are here to learn, right? 21st century educators are supposed to be innovative and creative. So if you don't have enough money to, to have a, like this one, the studio like right here, in Malaysia, it costs us about 100 over 1,000 ringgit Malaysia. So not all institutions, and the government will not, you know, give the money for this. For So the institution must come up with their own money to fund the uh, content development or to be creative enough. You can even have the uh, big area that you paint green color and you can use the, I'm sure Michael is also very creative to use even the what kind of camera to make your own eye studio, right? And there are many ways to uh, set up a, uh, to take video. You can also use the screencast app called like screencast automatic like that gives you only uh, 15 minutes 15 minutes is more than enough to have a video uh, to develop a video i'm showing you some of the video um, some of the uh, examples this is called the social media and learning called smile this is developed by the national university of malaysia so um, these are the uh, the module this is the open learning um, platform. So uh, this is where the course uh, module, for example, module two. So each of these thumbnail represent the content. Uh, this is the. These are the feedbacks. Like if the, if the uh, you know if the educators, if the developer create questions and ask them to share. was offered in 2016 by the University of Malaysia Terengganu. Uh, they have actually a, uh, I mean, their, their university is just beside the sea. They have this hatchery, hatchery of a uh, sea turtle. So this, the video just now, was developed by them. So um, the institution, the university, they have their own uh, technical team that take all these videos and and design so the good thing is some universities they have uh, their own id instructional designer they have their own technical team shoot the video and everything some of them just uh, some of the educators they just have to give in powerpoint or even microsoft word but some of the institution they don't have these facilities they they are the developer they are the film the the photographer videographer everything right so it depends but it's it, actually if you want to have efficient and good quality of course you want to have all this dedicated team to develop MOOC, right definitely i would want to do that because as an academician we are so busy doing other things, right? And we have to do like everything. Mm -hmm. Everything. And that's why when I, when I talk to my young, new lecturers, and I told them, if you think you want to become an academician and because you think it's easy, I think you sign the wrong form. 
Okay, in Putra, this is Putra Mu. Uh, we have, uh, these are some of the courses. This is the lifelong learning courses like, we have like the Malay Arts. If you want to know what are the Malay Arts, you can join our Putra MOOC. We have this called the Malaysian Food Heritage. Thailand and Malaysia are almost the same, almost the same. But, you know, we have each, each of country also have this. Even Indian uh, in the Malaysia, Malaysian Food Heritage also. Okay. Uh, this is actually my own my own my own MOOC that I developed together with my students, undergraduate students, is called the Amazing World of Microbes. And if you can see here, these are actually the 3D models of the microbe. Like this one, these are this is not grapes, okay? Th looks like grape. This is called the Staphylococcus. Bacteria. This is bacteria that cause acne on your skin, you know? Delicious. Looks delicious. This is not a good bacteria. <laughs> okay, so before we create uh, the content, we have to have the storyboard. What would be the learning outcome? What would be the material, learning resources? What would be the activities, right? And MOOC also can, your MOOCs also can be a platform for students to, students to create. You know, one of the characteristics of the 21st century educator is to become co-creators, co-learners. So MOOC can, MOOCs can be a platform for students to become co-creators, meaning that you get students to contribute content in your own MOOC so that you learn together, right? So what we did was we actually gamify the MOOC. We create a game and that game is like a scavenger hunt, okay? Scavenger hunt. In order for you to solve the, you to get a clue to go like a map to go to that place to find to find the, the 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 treasure you have to finish certain module finish the module then you get the clue then you go to the next stage each module is different Because of the music, the, the, the sound is only gone. Okay? Okay? Okay. <coughs> okay, so... Uh, no, no, it's okay. Ah, now, okay. Now, another, MOOC, another way of doing MOOC is by having what we call this one, a, a program called Virtual Microbes, right? For special education. Students from different universities work together with the students who are pre-service teachers going to teach te uh, going to teach students for with special education those with disabilities so my students for example taking micro they work together with students doing tassel teaching of english doing id together with the pre-service teacher to develop more of a module to teach about micro 
as simple as washing your hands. Right? As simple as washing your hand. If let's say if you don't wash your hand properly, what are the microbes? You know? And then these students with this module we give to the teachers so that they will learn how to teach the people, uh, students with disabilities. And after doing all this, we, uh, we go to the school uh, as part of our, what we call, service learning to the community to teach them about microbes. So in a way that with this, with this design, you are getting your students to have what we call to learn through experiential learning. One, experiential learning to learn by uh, uh, the uh, exp uh, to experience it themselves and to learn to work with the community. One, work experiential learning, work with the community and work in a cross discipline because TESOL is social science. Teachers are also social science and we are hard science, right? So we work transdisciplinary, okay? So this one is another one that I have created in 2017 involving 769 students from eight universities. Eight universities including one in Lafayette College, USA. So we get the students to meet. Uh, this is what, what I said. When we use, actually we use the MOOC, but we have time to meet virtually. This one we meet virtually. So, uh, we set, each group will set the time. It doesn't matter they are who, who, who uh, um, you know, they have to find a time that is suitable. The constraint here is the time zone. For example, in US, it's 10 a.m. We are here like 10 p.m. or 3 a.m. in the morning, right? So, they have to find the time to meet. And the... The discussion virtually is recorded, okay, and then upload in the YouTube and upload in this, uh, the, the, in MOOCs. <coughs> uh, we use Padlet, Padlet P, uh, to um, introduce each other and we use, uh, we use this platform to discuss. And this one is from Lafayette. Another way of doing MOOC is we work with the industry. For example, this MOOC, we work together with the Tanchong Automotive. You know Tanchong Automotive? In Malaysia, in Malaysia Tanchong is, uh, is a very big automotive company. Um, they produce uh, cars and they work with the uh, students to develop content about automotive. And that content can be used by other universities. So this is what we call the TVET MOOC. And um, besides having the content, the uh, con developing content, the industry also provide an uh, internship for those who completed their MOOC, intern for one year. This is another MOOC that we work together with the Erasmus. Erasmus, Erasmus. And they provide the grant we use platform Open edX. Uh, the University of Science Malaysia, Unimas, University of Malaysia Sarawak, together with the Sam Ratulangi in Indonesia, Brawijaya Universitas, and the University in uh, Philippines, in the Philippines. Uh, this um, the Erasmus universities are from the Netherlands, Germany and all Spain. And they work together to develop MOOC for those um, single mothers. Uh, MOOCs for single mothers, MOOCs for underserved committees, uh, communities. Uh, MOOC for under, uh, underserved communities. So uh, each of the country, they will determine the area so that, you know, they, they, they work, they call, they develop the con they visit the place develop the content with the community and now working with the industry to help these uh, people with uh, underserved communities so is it really bad in malaysia the dandelion oh, okay small one oh. so yeah 
Yeah, you see the dining hall like what Jim May has in her college. And this is the this virtual is, This is where they filmed classroom. Harry Potter. But they took all the portraits down and put fake ones up. So this is a virtual class. See, this is the class. This is the student from <laughs> from the UK. Okay, so I think uh, uh, come back to here. I think it's very important that when we develop a MOOC, we want to look at how it can be self-directed. International presence. Do you know that, you know how, uh, what about Malaysia MOOC, Thai MOOC, J MOOC, Korea MOOC, and visibility, also very important. Uh, new learning approach. Your MOOCs have to be different, to be unusual, to attract people. And of course, um, lastly, will be lifelong learning and culturation. Quality, uh, quality and quantity, also very important. Um, okay, so envisioning Malaysia MOOC meaning that how we want our MOOC to be in very near future. Now we are looking at gamifying the MOOCs, MOOCs into games, uh, to look for engagement, uh, more interactive MOOC, and uh, MOOCs with challenge based, you know, challenge based learning, and experiential, and lastly, transdisciplinary MOOCs. participation. Thank you. Wow. This is interesting. And I wonder where is my popcorn? <laughs> <laughs> Looks like we are in cinema. Uh, any questions any on the floor, please? No, no question, but just no, want to okay. give a compliment. <laughs> yeah, very good and interesting uh, uh, lecture. Give us some idea and uh, information that is very helpful. Mm. Uh, I just want to uh, thank you so much uh, for your kind compliments. I just want to um, share with you, you know the MOOC that I show you, The Amazing World of Microbes? We did that in three months. In three months, I was the head of the department at that time. We have 15 uh, lecturers in our department. So each, each lecturer will take one topic. Okay, so we have 15 topics, four modules. Each topic uh, is done by the lecturer with their mentee. Mentee are the students. The students are from first year until fourth year. So for that particular MOOC, the whole department were involved. And we did that during our semester break. So the, the lecturers will give them in the notes in PowerPoint, the students who um, reproduce it in the form of videos and games and all. 
but the content, the learning activity, the assessment will be checked through by the uh, lecturers. Then only we we publish. So I think is you know when uh, and all those done without grading. When they have to do, they are not being graded, but they just receive an acknowledgement from the department. So you see, it can be done if actually we uh, be creative and work together. Yes, very important. Yes. And also, Doctor, that so whenever we want to create some kind of discourse, we have to think and plan at the beginning. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, all together. Yes. And then step by step until the last step is yes. producing a course. Yes. Not just. <laughs> Not just a simple individual. Con yeah. other content yeah, yeah. Yes. That's the experience yes. of That's right. storyboard, everything has to be uh, reviewed very critically. Uh, yes. Not in a rush. Not in a rush. <laughs> Only <laughs> one month. <laughs> <laughs> but if uh, a lot of people working together, it can be fast. Yeah. Oh, thank you for thank your you. inspirational talk. Um, I really enjoy um, hearing um, how you emphasize on um, adding components that makes the uh, MOOC experience more active. Um, you know, having like you know video sessions. You know, I think that that is really important. But um, I'd like to hear your thoughts about scaling. You know, again, because I see like some of your courses, you have fifty thousand students, right? Yes. And I, and I hear your plan that you want to make it, you know, active. You want to make, you know, do gamification. Okay. Um, do you think that being able to automate uh -huh. these experiences is, is a requirement? Or do you think you will still rely on TAs or human interventions, you know, by teachers or okay. peer assessments? And, mm -hmm. you know, how are you going to scale this up? Okay, the one that you mentioned about 50,000, that is, for example, our Islamic civilization uh, and the other three courses, four courses that are compulsory for the 20 uh, public universities. What we did was we have the, uh, each, um, each course, we have 20 administrators. That means the students, uh, uh, each university will administer will be administered by their own administrator in the same course. And although it is shared content, but groupings are based on the uh, 20 public universities themselves. Content the same, delivery-wise is different. So delivery means um, how they use the content in the MOOC course. So, um, scaling up, you, uh, I think that is the biggest challenge for the engagement. Um, we need to actually do a lot of homework and research and learn more how to, en to, how to um, study, how, uh, how to engage uh, learners in the virtual learning environment. I think that is one of the challenge. Um, mainly, uh, mainly can be done for self-paced courses, right? Self-paced courses. Uh, unless you want to create like a the virtual learning community. Community means they create their own community. Let's say you post one critical questions, right? Wrong. One crit one critical questions. And one person will actually uh, respond to it. Another one will share a link. And you actually have to monitor. Okay? We don't have TAs. We don't have TAs, but we have uh, uh, the, our, whosoever, the developer will have their own uh, lectures, a few, a team. Okay? A team to, to administer and to give feedback. So the lecturers themselves are giving feedback to the um, forum or the uh, the response. So usually, um, coming um, coming back to uh, just now, it's actually come to us, come from us. How what kind of questions that can trigger that engagement? What kind of question? Cannot be just like you know what and how and what. 
can you must be something that why and how, what kind of instruction that you give to the learners to gain more participation and more sharing. So I think that is one of the ways to actually engage, to get the correct question, correct instruction. You can even some people say, oh, how can I use this online course to add value, you know, to create value, to develop and calculate value among students. The, if they ask me that kind of question, if I actually be asked, I was asking the same question, if during face-to-face, -face, how sure are you that you have, you know, developed and you have delivered how to get your students to learn to, uh, about value? So in the uh, virtual learning uh, or virtual learning environment, or VLE they call it, it's very important for us to give the correct question and correct instruction so that the student will be able to do. If let's say you, uh, like for me, for example, uh, I want to get the students to share about uh, microbes, take, take a picture of a microbe and tell them they have to take by themselves. That picture must be taken by themselves. That means the students have to go to the lab using the microscope, take picture and share again on the knee. So, empowering the learners one way of them uh, to get them to be involved uh, I, I, I like your uh, MOOC course on microbe thank you uh, I wonder that how can you motivate all of them to work together uh, to make that course because uh, uh, I think that is a voluntary Volunteer, yes, yes. yes. Uh, and it takes uh, three months to work to finish that course. To develop the course. Yes. At that uh, time. How, okay. how can oh, you okay. motivate them to um, work voluntarily? That question has been asked many times also. <laughs> um, the professors from other, other faculties were asking, how did you get your students to do yeah, the question? And then I told them, I just WhatsApp send WhatsApp only. But actually, I, um, I told them, uh, okay, we're going to do this, right? We're going to develop a course. But before I told them that we are going to do this, earlier on, you have to connect with your students. Meaning that you know your students, students know you, students know how you work. And these are done during the first semester. When they come into your class, you tell them that not all the things that you're going to do to be graded, that is the habit, become a habit. Give them a lot of work, a lot of assignment. They will complain at first, definitely. Some of them told me that, you know, is this first semester or final semester? <laughs> you know, like that kind of, uh, uh, that kind of a statement. But when it becomes a habit, then it's easier for you. It makes your life easier. They will do it even, even without being told. Because, they, because I get them to prepare before they come to class. During class also, they have to do work. After they go back from class also, they have to do work. So, as simple as one mind map. Submit one mind map before the class, for example. The first few mind maps, you have to tell them. But after that, you don't have to tell them, they will submit, become a habit, for example. So, I think because they know how I work with them, so when I say, okay, we're going to do this, it's like, oh, okay. It's like, you know, there is no other, no, <laughs> nobody will question. But the most important thing is to connect. I think, I think it's one of the, one of the, contribution to be connected to your students is this to make your life easier actually uh. of course uh, some of the some of the lecturers they were a bit um, how to say uh, intimidated because they may not know on how to create the content but I have assured them that you know you don't have to worry about developing the content you just give the material resources the students will know how to do so they were actually trained during the first semester. So first semester is very important. Yes, yes. 
Thank you very much for your uh, very uh, interesting presentation. I, I have some more questions. Oh, yes, yes. I am very happy that you have a national e-learning e policy. policy. Uh, yeah. yes. <clears throat> one, one of the dimensions in e-learning policy, you talk about the e-content, uh -huh. and you have the term original content. Original content, yeah. yes. Could you please clarify okay. about original and... Okay. Original content means here, uh, it's not Creative Commons license, meaning that if you make video, you cannot take from YouTube. If you like interview other people, you go out and interview people, you have to take your uh, the interview yourself. You cannot simply take other people's video, even though it is under OER. So it is uh, for us, the, the uh, material from other resources can be part of the additional material that you want the learners to to have at the end of your of your module but for the content development must be yours that means you develop yourself you create yourself you work together you collaborate with other people to develop the content so it has to be yourself uh, that is the meaning of original content uh. thank you very much thank you another question yes do the national e-learning policy apply to uh, normal university or apply uh -huh. to to which area? Okay, Who? the national e-learning policy apply to all private and public universities. Uh -huh. So, so from the, the the national policy mean that all university yes. should comply. Yes. So they should have a e uh, branded learning. Yes. And should have uh, some proportion of content. Yes. To be online. Yes. Yes, exactly. This is a reg regulation. Yes, all, it's a policy this. means regulation. If it is a guideline, it's not a probably it's not a, a, a regulation that you must comply. Uh, you you must comply. Guideline. Yeah. Yeah. Setting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. that will be under the uh, Ministry of Education under my division. Yeah. So. Uh, if I were to have this, uh, the the uh, ministry said must have a national policy, then I will get people from the universities as the committee for um, uh, the, the the universities and the industry. That means the stakeholders will be the committee to create to develop the policies. I see. Mm -hmm. Together with the Malaysian Qualification Agency. I see. Mm. Yeah. All together. Yes, all together. Right. Cannot be just one, one body or one organization. Right. Uh -huh. Very clear. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Anyone last question, please? Okay. Um, all right. This is getting to lunch time, so I think we are. Okay. So please join me to thank her again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over so much. Uh, before we um, conclude this morning's session, may I invite Dr. Anushai to um, say something. Thank you.